All right, everybody, welcome to Grand Rounds. We are thrilled to have with us a, uh, a Mount Sinai person today, Dr. Sylvia Reyes, who uh, you may know is a fellowship trained breast cancer surgeon with a clinical practice here at Union Square, dedicated to breast cancer management and an ass assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She's got uh, a master's degree, a clinical research fellowship, another clinical fellowship in breast surgical oncology. Um, and in addition to our practice, there's really focused on research and health equity and disparities in breast cancer care. And that's a lot of what she's gonna be talking to us about today. She serves as a founding committee member for the American Society of Breast Surgeons Health Equity Advisory Group, is a committee member for the ASBRS Young Surgeons Working Group and the National Hispanic Medical Association Communications Committee. Uh, and we're delighted to have her with us today, Dr. Reyes. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I'm excited to be here and I'm happy to talk about one of my favorite topics. So let me see if I can get this um, uh, screen shared. Good. Okay, everybody can see that. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Um, so let me just, just give me a second to hide you guys so I could see my slides. Good. All right. Um, so uh, so I'm going to talk today about really the impact of health disparities in breast cancer care and screening. Um, since screening, I think, is really the most relevant um, to your day-to-day -day practice, I really will put an extra focus on, on screening. Let's see if this lets me go to the next. All right, no financial disclosures. So before I really go into the meat of this talk, I just want to outline a few um, differences, uh, a few definitions really of health equity and really definitions of health equity in, uh, in relation to cancer. So for the American Cancer Society, health equity means everyone has a fair and just opportunity to prevent, find, treat, and survive cancer. It's important to really show this difference between equality and equity, as you, which I think is really um, nicely shown here by the American Cancer Society, where you can see equality is providing everyone with the same tools and resources. In this example, everybody is provided the same bicycle. And you can see that that means different things to different people. To the woman in the wheelchair, it's essentially useless. To the man who's very tall, um, he's not gonna get as far as that as uh, with that as the, the woman who fits nicely on the bicycle and you can see the difficulty with the child at the end. Whereas equity means providing tools and resources that are based on needs that allow everyone the opportunity to be as healthy as possible. So when we talk about health disparities, we're really outlining a particular type of health difference that's closely linked with economic, social, or environmental disadvantage. Health disparities can affect, adversely affect groups of people um, who have systematically experienced greater social or economic obstacles to health based on, and you can see this is a long list, racial or ethnic group, religion, socioeconomic status, gender, age, mental health, disability, sexual orientation or gender identity, geographic location, or other characteristics that have been historically linked to discrimination or exclusion. Now, um, in one hour, I'm not going to talk about all of that. So really what I'm going to focus on today is racial disparities. And the reason that disparities are really important for us to know about as healthcare providers is because this is really what can help us measure our progress toward health equity. So an outline of what I'm going to talk about. First, I'll give you an overview of racial disparities in breast cancer. Um, really, uh, the largest uh, disparities or most um, well studied are really the differences in incidence and mortality in breast cancer. And then followed by screening. What are we seeing these differences in screening, um, especially with all of the different recommendations that, um, that you have you know, different organizations within family medicine or internal medicine um, that have different screening recommendations and how that impacts these disparities. Um, also, I'll talk about what are some factors that contribute to these disparities, so socioeconomic factors. We know that biology is not the same for, for all groups. Um, so the stage at presentation, time to treatment, and also completion of treatment. And then finally, 
I'll leave you with methods that we can imply, um, apply to eliminate disparities and achieve progress toward health equity. So just to start off with some general cancer disparities facts, when we look at all cancers, and this is from the American Cancer Society, which I will quote often for the beginning of this talk because they do have the most updated um, and recent population numbers um, in regards to uh, disparities with cancer patients. Um, so we do know that people that have lower socioeconomic status do have higher cancer death rates um, than those that have higher socioeconomic status. And we know that the largest gaps are for the most preventable cancers, breast cancer being one of them. We also know that racial and ethnic minorities tend to receive lower quality healthcare than non-Hispanic whites. This has also been well studied and documented. Also for most cancers, black American patients have the highest death rate and the shortest survival of any racial ethnic group in the United States. And in a, a survey um, conducted by NPR, Harvard University and Robert Wood Johnson, um, 32% of black patients that were surveyed said that they have experienced racial discrimination at a healthcare provider visit. So now let's focus. So that was really just some um, uh, general, um, you know, when looking at cancer patients in general, um, what some of those studies have highlighted and shown. If we look at breast cancer specifically, here I'm focusing first on incidence and mortality. And this is from the American Cancer Society. You can see here in this lighter pink, um, the, the incidence rate, and in this darker pink is the death rate. And it's broken up by different racial ethnic groups. And so you can see that white and black American women are more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer compared to other ethnic groups. And you can see that here by these higher bar graphs. Um, but what you can also see is that if you look at the death rates, there's a significant bump in black women. And you can see that regardless of the incidence, we're seeing that black women are most likely to die from this disease, even though their incidence is pretty comparable. Another thing I'd like to point out in this, in this bar graph is if you look at this population here, which are Hispanic Americans, Latina Americans, um, they do generally have a lower incidence of breast cancer and lower mortality rates. Now, as we saw from some of those generalized cancer studies that I quoted, um, we do know that there are increased rates of socioeconomic challenges among Hispanic Americans as well as African Americans. And despite that, we still see this lower incidence and this lower mortality rate among Hispanics, which really does indicate that race is not a pure surrogate for socioeconomic status. So there's more to the story than just socioeconomic factors. Okay, so really just focusing in on the trends that we're seeing in the incidence. So if we look at breast cancer incidence over time, you can see here on the far left, this is 2001 up to 2015, the most updated um, charts from the American Cancer Society. And we can see that back in 2001, the incidence of breast cancer was really highest among non-Hispanic white women. And that's here in this darker pink. And if you look following, following second, is this lighter pink, which is non-Hispanic black women. I will say I am a breast surgeon. I like pink, but I don't think everything with breast cancer always has to be pink, um, but that's just how these, <laughs> these uh, charts really um, were provided. So um, what we can see is back in early 2000, this was considered more of a white woman's disease we didn't see as much of this incidence, as high of this incidence in black women or in other ethnic groups. But if you follow this over time, what we're seeing is that these two incidence lines, they merge, they're essentially merging. So over time, they've essentially merged where we're seeing that close 
um, similarity between incidents of white women and black women in America. And if we compare that with death rates, you can see that we're seeing the opposite effect. We're seeing more of a diverging and a persisting gap over time. So we can see that um, uh, two or three decades ago that the incidence and the death rate, if I can, how you can see right here between black and white Americans was pretty similar. And then over time, we saw an increase in this death rate significantly in black Americans. And that gap has really persisted over time. So the question is why, right? That's the question that everybody is trying to answer. So what factors are really contributing to this disparity that is so obviously seen in breast cancer data? So we know that there are socioeconomic factors. We know that biology is not the same in these two groups. I highlight these two groups, meaning Black Americans and white Americans, because that's where you can see that largest gap, that largest distinction between those two groups. Um, we know that stage at presentation is different among racial and ethnic groups, time to treatment and completion of treatment. So I'm gonna talk about each one of those um, in more detail. But overall, we know that tumor biology, ancestry, socioeconomics, these are all clearly interconnected and these associations are complex. So as I had said before, based on some of this data, what we've really been able to tease out is that race is not a pure surrogate for socioeconomic status. We know that poverty rates are higher in Hispanic Americans and African Americans, yet the breast cancer mortality rates are lower in Hispanic Americans, as I ha had pointed out before. We know that studies of breast cancer survival that control for socioeconomic status reveal persisting survival disadvantage among African-American patients. We know that the rates of triple negative breast cancer vary by race and ethnic identity with a higher percentage affecting um, black African-American patients. And there's also been genetic studies of Hispanic Americans that suggest the presence of germline or hereditary factors that may actually reduce their risk of breast cancer. So just an overview of really what, what is the distribution of these socioeconomic factors um, among these different, these different groups. Um, so if we look at life expectancy, we know that life expectancy here on the first row is, um, 78, estimated about 78 um, for non-Hispanic whites, and it's decreased among Black African Americans at 75, and Latinos is a little bit higher. Now that trend doesn't continue when we start looking at poverty rates. Poverty rates are higher among Blacks and Latinos. Um, the rate of uninsured, being uninsured is higher among Black and, and Latinos as well as the rate of obesity. I think you guys could probably talk about that more than me, diabetes. And of course, we know that hypertension adversely affects um, the black population um, significantly more as you can see here. So we've you know, studied this extensively and really seen that low income women, how does poverty really affect breast cancer incidence and, and survival? Well, we know that these women will have lower rates of breast cancer screening, have a decreased rate of having a regular primary physician who can actually um, follow up on these tests or prescribe, or prescribe them. Um, we know that these women will have a greater probability for late stage diagnosis, higher rates of inadequate or disparate treatment, um, higher mortality. And of course there's, um, the cost of the screening, cost of treatment, access to care is different in disadvantaged areas, lack of health insurance, difficulty taking time off of work or obtaining childcare, cultural fears that can be very significant among different um, racial and ethnic groups regarding if I show up for my mammogram, if something, if I'm diagnosed with breast cancer, did I bring that on myself? 
Um, did I do something? Is my family going to think that I did something to bring that on? And so that creates more fear about, I just don't wanna show up for that test. Um, there's higher rates of obesity and comorbidities in some of these um, uh, racial ethnic groups. And of course, there's also racism and social injustice as was highlighted earlier on in one of my slides um, that certainly there's a large percentage of patients that can say that they have experienced racism at a healthcare provider visit. And if that's the case, um, that certainly doesn't set somebody up for being able to really feel like you care about them and that your advice, your medical advice is really something that's in their best interest. Health insurance has really been, um, you know, really looked at and tried to address some of these, some of these disparities. Um, you know, we know that women who don't have health insurance are less likely than women with health insurance uh, to get mammograms. And so the most recent data in 2018 looked at women ages 50 to 74, and we saw that of those women that did not have health insurance, 39% of them had um, gone for their mammogram in the past two years, um, whereas 75% of those that did have health insurance did show up for their mammogram. And part of the effort in the Affordable Care Act to address this was to require that all new health insurance plans since September of 2010 cover this mammography screening every one to two years with no copayment, hoping to level out, um, you know, decrease some of this disparity. Um, there's other known risk factors um, of breast cancer that can also vary among different racial or ethnic groups that have been studied as well. Um, just a quick overview, age at first period, age at menopause, age at first childbirth, body weight. We, I highlighted the differences in the rates of obesity. Breastfeeding, breastfeeding is known to be, um, has been found to, to be um, less frequent in the African-American population, and that can be a protective factor for breast cancer. Um, number of childbirths or even the use of hormone therapies. So now let's focus a little bit on biology. What do we know about biology um, and how that's affecting these disparities? So if we focus really on triple negative breast cancer, which is this darker gray here, what you can see is in this first column, non-Hispanic white, triple negative breast cancer makes up about 10% of breast cancers that are diagnosed in that group. If you look at the non-Hispanic black column, what we're seeing is double that percentage. So 21% of breast cancers that are diagnosed in black women are triple negative breast cancer. And we know that triple negative breast cancer is much more aggressive breast cancer and can be associated with worse outcomes. Um, what we, there have been certain studies globally, international studies that have really looked at genetic predisposition and have studied um, the genetics within different populations and um, have found that there are certain countries in West Africa that if you have that West African ancestry um, does um, put women to a predisposition for triple negative breast cancer. So certainly we do know that biology contributes to these disparities as well. Also, the stage at which women are presenting. So um, here you can see this hot pink is the localized um, disease. That means that the breast cancer is presenting when it's only in the breast and hasn't spread anywhere. Um, this medium pink is regional disease, meaning that breast cancer has spread from the breast to the lymph nodes. And this pale pink is really um, distant disease or metastatic disease. And so when we look at who's presenting at what stage, we're seeing that this first column, non-Hispanic um, whites and Asian Pacific Islanders are less likely to be diagnosed at advanced stage. So I'm focusing really on advanced stage, which is this medium pink and this pale pink. Um, so we see this smaller fraction among non-Hispanic whites and Asian Pacific Islanders 
compare to this larger group among non-Hispanic Black women. So they have the highest rates of distant disease at presentation and the highest rates of regional disease at presentation. So when we look at, um, you know, it was thought that, okay, well, if we're seeing that they're presenting at, that Black women are presenting at um, later stages, then may, that can account for some of this difference in survival. These, these mortality uh, differences. But when you really break it down stage for stage, we're still seeing that disparity. So you can see here, this is localized treatment. If you see that localized you know, breast cancer has very favorable outcomes um, with a five-year survival uh, rate always in the 90s, right? But you can still see that black women, even for local disease, will have decreased survival rates. Even more so when you look at regional disease, there's a more significant dip. They are much less likely to survive compared to the other racial and ethnic groups. And then distant disease, you can see again, right here with uh, non-Hispanic Blacks being this paler pink, you can see that dip continues stage for stage. So one of the thoughts were, well, is everybody showing up for their mammograms, right? Maybe that's the difference. Maybe that's what we can do to help. Um, and so there certainly have been campaigns to try to increase uh, community education on the importance of screening. Um, in the past, we know that African-American women were less likely than white women to get their regular mammograms. And that may be contributing to some of the differences that we're seeing in these survival rates now. Um, but really with the most recent data, we're seeing that pretty much everyone's showing up at pretty similar rates. You can see non-Hispanic Blacks are showing up at 74%, um, non-Hispanic Whites at 73%, and Hispanics and Asian Americans at 71%, and the lowest being with um, non-Hispanic American Indians and Alaska Natives at 66%. So screening, we know that screening early detection saves lives. So we're seeing that women are showing up for their mammograms. They are trying to get diagnosed early. Um, regular mammograms, we know that these can reduce the rate of breast cancer death by up to 23% in women ages 40 to 49. And so um, there certainly are still campaigns to increase these numbers, but this doesn't seem to be the source of, of these disparities. What may be a source um, is screening guidelines. So right now, this is a very busy slide. I don't expect you to read all of it. This is really just to emphasize how many different recommendations you guys have to choose from. So the American Society of Breast Surgeons, we recommend screening um, with mammography starting at age 40 annually. And as you can see, most of these, most of these um, um, task force or organizations, this top row is really focused on women age 40 to 49 with average risk. Most of them are non-committal for this group. They say oh, it could be a shared decision-making, um, discuss it with your doctor, not really strong evidence. Um, only a couple will say, okay, maybe after 45, then you should consider it annually. American College of Radiology seems to go with American Society of Breast Surgeons as well with annually starting at 40. And then when you hit age 50, that's when most of these organizations and societies are saying you should start um, screening mammography every one to two years. So if we're starting screening, if the real recommendation here is to start screening at age 50, then who is that really affecting? So to answer that question, we really have to look at the age. Who is getting, who, who is getting um, diagnosed at a young age? Who's getting diagnosed um, between the ages of 40 and 49? And if we look at all races, we can see that 40 to 49 is affecting 14% um, not affecting is that 14% of all breast cancers are diagnosed within this age group. 
So by starting screening at age 50, we're missing 14% of the population. Now, the next question is, is this evenly distributed among racial groups? It is not. So if we look at for non-Hispanic whites, 12% of the of breast cancers in this group are within that age group, 40 to 49. But if you look at non-Hispanic Blacks and American Indians, we're seeing it's increasing 16%, 15%, even more in Hispanics, where by recommending screening starting at age 50, you're missing 21% of Hispanics with breast cancer, 23% of breast cancers in Asian Pacific Islanders. And what does that translate to? So that translates to later stage. If we're not getting mammograms on these women earlier on, then they are going to present at a later stage. Um, as we've seen, um, is higher likelihood in Hispanics and Black Americans. This I thought was just an interesting um, slide just to check, to, just to see how are we doing in New York? So we know that incidence and mortality rates can be different in different parts of the, of, of the United States. So the United States average, we're seeing this incidence 126, that's per 100,000. Um, and in New York, we're close behind with 121. Our, our incidence among non-Hispanic whites in New York is higher, 141, compared to the national average of 130. And our mortality rates are decreased in non-Hispanic Black women at 25 compared to the national of 28. And also our mortality rates for non-Hispanic whites is decreased at 19. Um, compared to uh, 20 in the United States. But we can still see that even in New York, we can still see that the mortality rates is pretty different between black and white Americans. And even here on this side, we can see that women in New York are showing up for their mammograms um, at rates comparative to the national average. So, so far, I've really just been talking about average risk. Um, do we see disparities in high risk screening? We certainly do. We know that MRIs are recommended for women that have lifetime risk of breast cancer more than 20%. And this is based on risk models that include family history or other factors. Um, we recommend them for patients that have high risk pathologies such as LCIS or have genetic predispositions to breast cancer. And in this study that I'm, I'm highlighting, um, where they did look at the use of screening MRIs in community practice by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status, they did find that Black women overall did not have the same risk perception as white women. And therefore, they were less likely to advocate for supplementary screening studies such as MRI. They're less likely to have MRI recommended by their provider. Um, could be also attributed to the less likelihood of having a regular provider. Um, and they also found that screening with MRI was more likely to occur in white women than other races. So in New York City, which is where we all are, um, we certainly do have a high population of Latinas. And how does that, how does that play into disparities? So Hispanic Americans overall are a difficult group to study because of the heterogeneity that really exists among ancestry and also levels of acculturation among Hispanic Americans. If you were to compare um, my mother who grew up in, in, who was born and raised in Colombia, her experiences, her views on healthcare, her ability to navigate the system and compare that to my own, very, very stark differences, but yet we would be grouped together uh, in many of these studies. Um, we see that there's inequities in socioeconomic resources that are also seen within um, categories of individuals that are grouped together as Hispanic. So we can see that poverty rates range from 16% in Cuban Americans versus 26% among Dominican Americans. Um, we know that there's a lower incidence rate for most Hispanic subgroups compared with 
white Americans. Um, but when you really select out Puerto Ricans, they actually have a higher incidence rate. And there certainly have been genetic studies in Hispanic American um, women that have revealed that really the extent of Native American ancestry is associated with a protective effect against developing breast cancer. So just as an overview of um, Latinas and breast cancer, we know that there's sl slightly lower rates of breast cancer screening. There's a younger age at diagnosis, 21% are diagnosed between the ages of 40 and 49, and that they're more likely to present with advanced disease. Hispanic Americans may have a higher number of barriers to getting screening mammograms um, than women of other ethnicities. This has been studied and shown that um, factors such as insurance, immigration status, language barriers are other factors that um, may contribute to this difficulty. And even screening among Hispanic Latina women varies by group. So um, again, so if you select out Puerto Rican women are more likely to get their screening mammograms than um, non-Hispanic white women. Um, they're more likely to get screening mammograms than Cuban Americans and Mexican American women. And I think this last statement is really something that um, is also um, you know, pretty powerful in the Hispanic women that have lived in the United States for a long period of time are more likely to get mammograms. So a culture assimilation um, really does have an impact on um, preventive health. Uh, language barriers, I, I touched on that a little bit. Um, just some of the things that we've seen um, in terms of health outcomes in patients that have limited English proficiency, um, they will have a decreased likelihood of having a regular primary care physician. They are less likely to have health insurance, less likely to have an education at the high school level or higher. Um, may have more difficulty navigating the current healthcare system because of this language barrier and are less likely to understand discharge instructions well. Um, this has translated in certain studies to worse outcomes um, in, in cancer patients, but those studies are still small studies. And so the, um, those numbers aren't as um, robust. But I think that when you look at these um, disadvantages with limited English proficiency, it reminds me of that same drawing, that same cartoon that we saw in the beginning, right? If we're seeing this increased disadvantage, then perhaps they need a different type of bicycle, right? And perhaps we need to meet that need in a different way. Um, other things, um, so, so if we break down um, differences, right? Uh, disparities, we're ta we've talked about um, um, prevention, diagnosis, um, you can break it down to, you know, accessing care and then actually getting diagnosed and then having the treatment, the delivery of care. And so we've seen that socioeconomic status certainly can have a, a negative influence on the timeliness of having your diagnostic biopsy um, after an abnormal screening study. So it may take a much longer time for um, for some of these women in some of these racial or ethnic groups to actually get that diagnostic biopsy, therefore delaying their care. Um, delays in diagnostic biopsy may mitigate the benefits that we've seen with screening mammography, meaning which is really the benefits of screening mammography is early detection, right? So if you're delaying that biopsy, you're mitigating that benefit. We also know that the socioeconomic status disadvantages are reflected by differences in delivery of care. Um, without going into too much detail, you know, we know that breast cancer care can be divided into three main categories. There's surgery, there's radiation, and there's medicine. Medicine can be divided into um, endocrine medication, chemotherapy, HER2 therapy. So in all of these areas, we've seen that 
there certainly can be differences in delivery of care which can contribute to these disparities. So um, from a surgical standpoint, um, across the United States, there have been um, differences seen within the um, offering of lumpectomies, right, for, for smaller breast cancers, um, and women that are offered mastectomies in certain racial ethnic groups are less likely to be offered plastic surgery at the same time. And this is, you know, sometimes in, um, depending on, you know, what type of cancer center you are, some of the laws within the, um, the state, um, we've seen differences in delivery of care for sentinel lymph node biopsies. Um, now, you know, our, we have many studies that have shown not everybody needs an axillary lymph node dissection. And so we can really spare these women um, this high morbidity by offering a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And that should be offered to every woman that meets the criteria. Um, we can also know that, so this increased mortality burden from breast cancer can be mediated or is mediated by the combination of healthcare access barriers also with inefficiencies in delivery of care. So time to treatment is one of the, the ways, one um, objective measure that we can use to see, um, to, to test some of these disparities. And um, a group of us here at Mount Sinai were interested in seeing, well, you know, New York City here, we have um, a, a very unique setting in where our transit system is so robust, so access to care is not as much of a disparity as it may be in rural parts of America. Um, and in a multidisciplinary breast center, that's where you know the we have um, everybody's there, right? So you can see the surgeon, you can see the radiation oncologist, you can see um, the medical oncologist, you can have your biopsy done, everything within the same building, everybody helps navigate, um, can help navigate that access. So the idea was, well, we know that comprehensive breast centers can improve patient outcomes by centralizing multiple medical and surgical specialties, um, that are involved in breast cancer care. And so we wanted to evaluate the effect of receiving care at um, one of these breast centers, which um, this data was from the Uptown group um, on time to treatment for historically underrepresented populations. So this is a prospectively maintained database. Um, this data was just presented this past week at Society of Surgical Oncology's annual conference. Um, it was a total of 2,094 breast cancer patients with 59% being non-Hispanic white and 13% um, non-Hispanic black and 14% Hispanic. Um, eligibility was, it had to be non-metastatic breast cancer. Um, woman needed to be treated from 2012 to 2018, had to have um, race, ethnicity and time to treatment data available and um, must not have had prior treatment. And so the treatment intervals that we could look at um, and really um, collect that data objectively is the time from breast cancer diagnosis to the initiation of treatment, the time from breast cancer diagnosis to the initial breast center consultation, and then also the consultation interval. So from the time of consultation to treatment. And what we found was there are baseline differences between racial and ethnic groups. Um, Black and Hispanic patients had higher rates of Medicaid insurance, higher ASA scores, advanced stage of breast cancer at presentation, um, needed additional imaging workup, and had higher rates of mastectomies. And when a multivariable analysis where we controlled for all of these factors, um, what we did see was that there were longer treatment intervals um, in non-white racial ethnic groups, longer treatment intervals in patients that had Medicaid were uninsured, um, those that had older age or ASA more than two, those that had mastectomy and reconstruction, and those that needed additional imaging workup like biopsies, also genetic testing. So essentially, 
we still have work to do. Even in New York City, um, non-white women experience significantly longer times to treatment, even when receiving care at a comprehensive breast center. Influential factors in, include insurance and the necessity of additional pretreatment workup. And um, that definitely we do need specific programs and policies to address these health system barriers in treatment access. Um, so the next topic would be treatment completion. So we know that there's a delay in getting treatment. What about once you're in the door, how many women can actually complete treatment? So some treatments such as chemotherapy, we certainly know by multiple studies that this is associated with increased survival rates and, and better ca cancer outcomes. Factors such as insurance, access to care and social support um, have been documented to influence this ability to complete life-saving treatments. Um, and this was something that I was interested in um, early on when I was a, a research fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I had said, you know, I'm interested in looking at disparities. And so we really teamed up with um, Nina Bikel here at Mount Sinai um, to look at factors affecting the completion of adjuvant chemotherapy. And we focused on earlier stage um, breast cancer. Um, so um, breast cancer that had not spread, that had no distant disease. Um, and we used this uh, parent study that uh, Nina Bikel had, um, had already um, um, designed. It was a multi-center parent study that was used to evaluate the use of patient assistance programs in post-operative early stage breast cancer patients that required adjuvant therapy. And these were stage one to three breast cancer patients that had surgery between 2006 and 2009 that all required adjuvant treatment um, and had no history of prior treatment. And these patients were given two surveys, a baseline survey, which was within two to four weeks after surgery, and this was more of a needs assessment. And they were also given a six month follow-up survey to really assess their experiences with care, health status, social support, self-efficacy, knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs about breast cancer and its treatment. So um, I'm gonna try to go through this quickly just because I wanna make sure that we have time for questions and discussions. Um, so what we did was we really just compared uh, differences between patients that completed their chemotherapy and those that did not. We looked specifically at demographics and clinical factors, physical and emotional factors, and perceptions and beliefs. And one of the things that I, I thought was really interesting about this study is up until then, I had really just done mostly um, uh, focused on like objective data. This was one of my first introductions on how can we tease out some of these social factors um, that we know play a role in certain disparities. And so this being a parent study that addressed so many of these questions um, in a survey type um, was really was really interesting for me. Um, so you know we compared all of these demographic and clinical factors, physical and emotional factors. So measuring instrumental social social support, meaning like you know do you have somebody to bring you to your chemotherapy appointment? Um, you know how much of that kind of social support do you have? Emotional social support. Um, you know, um, through friends, family, neighbors, um, and then also perceptions and beliefs about chemotherapy treatment um, were assessed using different questions. Um, so the study cohort was 374 um, patients that we focused only on those that were referred for an initiated chemotherapy, which was then 223. And um, those that completed the six month survey was then 201. And then those that had the complete data to, to form our study cohort was then 198 patients. And what we found was because this was a, a parent study that really was already providing patient assistance uh, programs, um, the rate of completion was really high, 93%. Um, only 13 patients did not complete chemotherapy. And when we um, looked at the differences in bivariate analyses, we did see that 
um, race was a significant factor. Um, women that, that were of Black African-American um, descent um, had, uh, were more likely to be, uh, to not complete chemotherapy compared to other groups. Um, and uh, we did see that Medicaid insurance was almost significant, but not as much as we had seen in other, um, other similar studies. Side effects I thought would definitely be a big factor. And you can see here, none of them showed um, significant reasons for why these women didn't complete chemotherapy. Uh, when it came to um, emotional social support, this uh, was shown to be um, significantly contrib contributing to um, not completing chemotherapy. And on our independent, on our multivariate analysis, um, again, we continue to see that Black African-American race um, was a significant um, factor for not completing chemotherapy. Um, what I think is really interesting about that statement is in part of writing this manuscript and looking at the data comparatively, um, there are similar studies that were conducted in, in Georgia. So this was here in New York City, um, but it, a similar study in Georgia that was looking at the completion of chemotherapy found that being of Black or African-American race um, was a protective factor. So it was really much more a surrogate for what kind of social support do you have? Because in, in, the, in that particular area, um, there was a really high rate of um, community of church involvement that really helped support um, those women. And so being of black race was uh, a protective factor making them more likely to, to complete their chemotherapy. Uh, limitations were that this study was small. It's not, it can't, it can't be generalizable to um, uh, you know, the, a larger population. Um, these completion rates were higher than compared in the SEER database, which were um, non-completion in some studies were up to 36%. Um, small sample size, and we did see that body image was uh, an independent factor, but we had only really assessed that with, with one question. Um, so these, I already essentially went through that. Um, what we did conclude was African-American race, Medicaid insurance, presence of comorbidities and poor body image were significantly associated with the failure to complete chemotherapy. Um, and, um, Really, this suggests that strategies to identify and address these patient perceptions may improve rates of compliance with adjuvant chemotherapy recommendations. So lastly, I just wanna make sure that we go through what do we do about it, right? So now we see, we know that this exists, we know it's out there, what do we do about it? So what are we doing about it already? So here at Mount Sinai, we have a mobile mammography program. This can improve access to, to women to have their mammogram. So bring the mammogram to them. Um, also improving access to primary care, not through this van, but that is a way of removing um, some of these barriers to screening. Um, this van currently visits all five boroughs and there's the number if you ever want to refer you know, if you have a patient that has difficulty um, going for their mammogram or has different barriers, this can certainly be helpful for them. Um, removing financial barriers. So we talked about the Affordable Care Act, how, you know, certain insurance companies are making a priority to cover screening with no co-payments. Um, removing language barriers. Um, at Mount Sinai, we all have uh, interpreting services, um, also uh, community education, these health campaigns that can address these negative beliefs about mammography are really important uh, for reducing these barriers um, and these disparities. Um, and overall, just improving cultural competency among healthcare providers, which you guys are doing by listening to my talk. <laughs> And here's one thing that I like to do. So I am 
Latina, there's a big focus on family. And um, one of the things that, you know, yes, I'm old enough to get my own mammogram. And so this is last year, I went with uh, my mother right here, my mother-in-law and my mother-in-law's sister. And we really all just went together and said, let's make sure we do this annually. And it really gives accountability. It gives family members a reason to get together. Um, it can reduce these cultural fears that can be associated with it. My aunt hadn't shown up for her mammogram in 10 years. I wanted to kill her. <laughs> and this was one of the only ways I could get her to show up for it. You know, if there's that underlying fear, what if they find something? Well, if they do, you've got your family right there with you. So this is certainly one way that um, you can help to remove some of these barriers. Suggest that family members go together. Uh, what about within the institution? Data, data, data. One of my favorite, um, one of my favorite quotes is, "In God we trust. All others must show data." <laughs> and so, when we're talking about racial and ethnic um, disparities, we need to prove it. We need to prove it. We need to measure it. Quality improvement projects can really help us show um, how we're doing and if we're moving in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> designating specific leaders for disparities um, reduction. So in Mount Sinai, there's the Mount Sinai Task Force to address racism. Um, definitely, you know, within um, departments, identifying and recognizing these equity champions, you know, certain um, providers that are you know, eager and willing to take on some of these projects and to, to lead some of these tasks. And representation, representation matters. We know that there's been lots of studies that have shown that. So recruiting a diverse workforce that reflects the population that you serve can certainly be helpful, especially in some of those language barriers. Um, compensation to quality goals that include disparities reduction that can certainly be an institutional way to help decrease these disparities and help us go more towards health equity. Um, maintaining a strong relationship with community-based organizations. So I'm talking to you as other medical professionals, but I also give talks to the community um, in Spanish in, because I, I speak Spanish. And so that's something that I can give as a provider um, to really help address some of those community fears that can be associated with, um, with um, a delay in care or a delay in um, screening. And a great resource here at Mount Sinai is the United in Solidarity um, website um, that can certainly um, expand on this more. Um, so what about in our daily practice? So enrolling in programs that reimburse for services for low-income patients. So there are some programs like free pap smear programs, pharmaceutical assistance programs. Um, having referral information available for your patients for social work departments. So the minute a patient says that they're having difficulties, you know, to be able to have that social worker on speed dial um, that your, your team knows to reach out to the social worker, find out what resources are available for this patient. Um, we certainly do that in our breast practices. Um, you know, if a patient says they can't, they can't afford the, the biopsy or they've had a change in insurance, you know, n send them that way towards the social worker or finance department to help figure out how they can help. Um, <clears throat> Hiring clinical and office staff who are culturally and linguistically representative of the communities in your practice uh, that your practice serves. Um, marketing yourself, you know, letting people know that you um, are somebody that you know stands for health equity is is trying to um, you know reduce these disparities, and that you have if you are doing that, then you will likely have these resources available, these different types of bicycles, right? Available for different patients. Um, exploring the current organizational climate, culture, policies, we all need to take a minute to look at ourselves. Is there anything that we are doing to contribute it? We talked about 
um, you know, how different screening practices can be affecting some of these disparities. Um, so looking at, you know, what are some of the things that, you know, we're doing when, when a patient calls my office, how are they greeted? Are they immediately felt to feel like we don't care about them? Because that can, you know, really ring true in, in um, you know, nobody likes that, but certainly that can have a, a, a bigger impact in some people. Um, language services, um, we talked about how the importance of that, um, cultural competency training, measuring the quality of care um, delivered. Again, that's me saying that we need data. We need to track our own data. Um, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of us don't really like these patient surveys, but, um, you know, they're important to see where are we, what are people actually feeling when they come to our, to our practice? What you know, do they feel like we are really giving them advice in their best interest? Um, and a suggestions box. And I apologize, I did not put my um, source here. It was a great article, I will add that. Um, so in conclusions, Really measuring disparities begins in our own offices. This is not just a national or geographic problem. Um, new strategies and approaches are needed to promote breast cancer prevention, improve survival rates, and improve outcomes among different um, racial and ethnic groups. And society organization guidelines, the recommendations for screening need to include racial or ethnic variations. Um, I'm very proud um, to have been selected to be part of the American Society of Breast Surgeons Health Equity Advisory Group. One of the things that we're working on right now is a position paper um, on how race, um, the racial influence in screening and really our position paper from the American Society of Breast Surgeons regarding race and breast cancer screening. And representation, representation in research and healthcare delivery. This is all vital um, so that racial disparities can be well studied, fully addressed, and ultimately eliminated. Thank you. And um, I welcome any questions. I'm going to grab water for a second. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Reyes. So we have about two minutes for questions. I really I'm so sorry. The well, that's all right. And, and fortunately, you've given us uh, ways to reach out to you. So I have a feeling people will follow up with you with questions. Anything uh, pressing that people want to ask right now, either in the chat or by unmuting themselves? Hi, Dr. Riaz. Um, I actually have a question. I'm Isabel, I'm one of the chief clinical residents here. Thank you for an amazing talk. And I can say that I'm really passionate about this topic. So if you saw me smiling during the whole way, it was something that reflected that. Um, I do have a question. Um, I'm Puerto Rican, so um, a lot of us, uh, just to give you an example on the census that we that we received and in the island, we did a lot of self-reporting and, you know, in the race and, and ethnic um, portion of it. And and a lot of people, you know, identified as white, um, the majority of the population, um, and a lot of them didn't identify as black. And, and when I came to the United States, I did notice that there was this trend to um, Hispanic black or Hispanic white, right? And it was difficult for me to kind of put in those boxes given the heterogeneity of our population. And I know that you were speaking about um, Latinas and um, their incidence in breast cancer. Is there, you know, any way, I know self-reporting is very difficult, right? There could be sort of like a, you know, our own biases right there. Have you noticed that between, you know, what we would call like, you know, Hispanic and the Latina population, whether or not the stratification of sort of like what we call Afro-Caribbean, Black Hispanics and, you know, what we call white Hispanics is being utilized? Or is that something that, you know, was just something in the census that we used in Puerto Rico and they just identified us? So, you know, it wasn't until um, I, I worked in like uh, medical school admissions, I did like work study when I was a medical student, mm -hmm. um, that I even thought about this. You know, I, I was like, wait, so am I supposed to be checking off white? And it was the first exactly. time I really had to, to look at that. And I was like, I've never identified as that. And then I almost, you know, was like, well, wait, so then if I do something really great, is that being categorized as white? Or, you know, how is that, how is that even working? Um, 
And so I think really which box you check is really more of a social construct, right? It's not, um, it's, it's uh, I like that a lot of these studies specifically say non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic white. So they, they really um, select us out of that. Mm -hmm. My husband is Puerto Rican. We've had this conversation. I've asked him, what box do you check? And he's like, I'm Taino, I'm this, I, I got, I check off every box, <laughs> you know, he, he's like, I check off Native American, I check off white, I check off black, you know, and I'm like, well, I think you're confusing people because in research that may not be helpful. Exactly. So I think that certainly is more of a social construct. And I think that um, I know that the SEER database has certainly made moves to um, incorporate, to differentiate that because yeah. it is difficult with you know, I said, uh, you know, Hispanics are very heterogeneous um, to be able to identify solely as black or white. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Reeves. Sure. All right, it's 101. I think we have to stop there. Thank you so, so much. We really appreciate it. And All right, thanks for having me. We will connect again. Take care.